I basically tried to. I was originally asked to talk uh, more on the field campaign side of things, but I wanted to expand it a bit uh, in terms of some of the NASA research satellites, which haven't been discussed in great detail today. Uh, and I want to just talk about the data sets themselves and how they can help you to uh, advance hurricane science. Uh, at NASA, we contribute to uh, hurricane research in four different ways. Uh, our first and foremost, our mission is uh, through satellite remote sensing. Uh, but we also do a lot of sensor development for uh, developing new technologies for future missions. Uh, we do calibration and validation activities uh, through field campaigns, but it's also a great opportunity for us to do science. Uh, and then because of the sampling that's often done both from the satellite and field campaigns is somewhat limited in space and time, we try to couple that with the numerical modeling uh, to, to bring all these resources together to uh, improve hurricane science. Now we have um, quite a few satellites up in space at the moment uh, that have some applications to hurricanes. Our primary ones are, uh, are shown here on the top three, at least for the past 10 years or so. Uh, as many of you know, QuickScat, unfortunately, has uh, stopped collecting wind data. Uh, our, our workhorses, though, are really Trim and Aqua, and then Terra provides additional MODIS data. But in addition, we have uh, satellites such as Calypso that provides uh, vertical structure of aerosol information for those looking at the Saharan air layer. Uh, CloudSat gives vertical structure information of clouds from a cloud radar. And then there's the JSON satellite that gives altimetry information for looking at ocean heat content. Uh, as I said, TRIM has really been one of our major workhorses. It's been flying for 12 years now, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. If you're not, you're either new to the field or you've been comatose for 10 years or so. Um, uh, but its, its main feature is it really gives us this three-dimensional structure of precipitation uh, within hurricanes, uh, in addition to uh, microwave imagery that gives you the two-dimensional view of precip. Uh, and then there's a lightning uh, imaging sensor as well. So a lot of great information together. Uh, and I wanted to, to illustrate some of the, the variety of the data sets and how they can be used and, and brought to bear in the hurricane problem. thought I'd show an example of how of application of the, the satellite data to the problem of the Saharan air layer using MODIS and Calypso to look at dust, airs uh, to look at temperature and humidity profiles, and then TRAM and AMSERI on AQUA to look at rainfall. Um, and the, the, um, to get into this example, it's going to be based on a recent paper by Reale et al., where they looked at uh, water vapor distribution for a wave that had just come off of Africa, and they noted here's the, uh, this very dry air being pulled into the wave. Uh, and then when they looked at a vertical cross section and looked at temperature perturbations, they found this elevated warm layer aloft within that dry area. Uh, and, and they essentially assumed that that was dry Saharan air that was being wrapped into the storm and suppressing development of the wave. Uh, and it turns out I, I decided to write actually a comment on this paper because I disagree with her finding on this. Uh, and the interesting thing is the authors work in my lab, so, uh, so it makes things interesting at work. Uh, but here's MODIS imagery. Here, this is the MODIS AOD in this color scale and trim 24-hour precipitation from the multi-satellite product. And this is on August 26, and here's one dust outbreak in this area. You can see the elevated dust here. This is Tropical Storm Debbie, which had been closer to the dust, but then gradually moved northward. And then here's a, a second stronger dust outbreak that had just recently come off of Africa. The contours here are the 700 millibar geopotential height field from the GFS, as well as the wave relative flow at 700 millibars. And one of the things you can see here is that the wave relative flow is bringing this very low dust content air down into the wave between these two dust air masses. And when you look at the uh, air's relative humidity field shown in the shading here, the red lines here show those dust, out, dust boundaries. I'll kind of go back there. You can see the, those dust outbreaks. And then here are the boundaries of them. This is SAL1 and SAL2. Notice that the driest air between 0 to, say, 40 percent is to the north and west of SAL2 and is what is being brought down into this relatively dust-free tongue. Uh, that should be a first indication that perhaps this is non-Saharan air. If we look at a Calypso overpass along this gray line, that's shown here with height along this axis. And uh, 20, degree, 20 degrees north is roughly the northern edge of SAL1. And you can see here is the dust structure within that Saharan outbreak 
But as you get into this dry air just ahead of SAL2, you'll notice that there's virtually no dust whatsoever. Most of the signal you see here is from boundary layer clouds. Um, and, and we also confirmed using trajectory uh, calculations from the GFS that indeed all this air is non-Saharan and is largely associated with dry subsiding air. And that is what's giving you the warming and the drying. It's not because it's of Saharan origin. Um, and to some extent, this has implications then for interpretation of other satellite imagery. For example, the TPW data from the microwave and even the GO-SAL analyses. Uh, here's this dust outbreak again, SAL2 on this day and the uh, dust-free air just to the west. Here's the, the, the boundary of this dust outbreak in, in both of these plots. And uh, it, this sort of uh, goes against the some of the key assumptions that have been in many of the SAL studies that have looked at the negative impact of the SAL. One assumption is that dry tropical air is SAL air. You can see that someone, uh, and I think I know who, labeled all these dry pockets here SAL. But if you look at where the SAL air masses were, they were really right here and right here. So clearly, you can get dry uh, air masses there due to large-scale subsidence. And in fact, they often can be the dominant feature rather than the sal air masses. In addition, there's often an assumption that dry, sal air is dry. And clearly, that is not true. Uh, and in fact, on average, the sal air mass is dry at low levels but becomes relatively moist at mid-levels, sometimes even saturated at the top of the sal. Uh, and then when you look at the go-sal analysis, you can see that the correspondence between the orange, which is supposed to indicate SAL, and the SAL boundary isn't very good. And this dry uh, air mass that had been out ahead of the dust layer uh, is colored orange as well. So there isn't really a great correspondence, at least in this example, between the GO-SAL SAL analysis and the actual SAL air mass. So it means we really need to be careful in applying simpler uh, analyses like this. And it really helps to bring in the more sophisticated analyses from MODIS and, and other platforms to understand what's going on. Now I want to move on to the field campaigns. Uh, NASA has done four field campaigns so far, the, the two convection and moisture experiments, which were done out of Florida, the tropical cloud systems and processes experiment, which was done out of Costa Rica in 2005, and then the, the NAMA experiment, which was done out of Western Africa in 2006. Uh, generally, what we, uh, the aircraft that we bring to bear in these field campaigns are the NASA ER-2, which is a high-altitude aircraft, flies around 65,000 feet. Uh, the NASA DC-8 flies around 40,000 feet. And then we're always partnering very closely with NOAA, uh, trying to fly together with the NOAA P-3s. And our focus in most of these experiments has been on, on the developing a mature structure of cyclones with an emphasis on processes involving water in all of its phases. Um, and they're, they're often uh, also done uh, for calibration of, and validation activities, particularly for the TRIM satellite. Uh, here are the cases that have been collected so far from these experiments. Uh, you can see that on, on average, we get about four well-sampled cases each time. In NAMA, there were two tropical cyclones plus several non-developing waves. Uh, so it, 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 we're developing a very good database, not, not only within the NASA data, but the NOAA data, data sets as well uh, on all these cases. Um, here is just a, a very quick description of the instruments that are often used on these aircraft. You'll be able to get uh, these uh, slides from the website later, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. But basically on the ER-2, we tend to have the ER-2 Doppler radar, uh, a microwave radiometer, lightning package, uh, we've had a microwave sounder and temperature profiler, vis and IR uh, information, as well as a cloud radar in one uh, experiment. Uh, on the DC-8, we've had a variety of microwave radiometers, radars, drop sun systems, uh, several microphysical probes, uh, a LIDAR system for getting aerosols and water vapor. Uh, we, we've tested some wind LIDARs in the past, although they haven't been terribly successful in those experiments, and then some additional uh, instrumentation. Uh, I wanted to show a few examples uh, of uh, data collected during these field campaigns. Uh, two of these are going to be from Hurricane Emily during the TCSP experiment in 2005. Uh, this is an example of EDOP data uh, on the ER-2. Uh, and, and it's one of the few times where the pilot, after having done two flights over the storm, decided he was not going over it again. He had been rocked around by such severe turbulence that the aircraft almost stalled. And so he ended up doing box patterns around the eye wall instead of overpasses over the eye. And this is the reason for that turbulence. Look at these reflectivities. 
I mean, you're getting 40 to 50 dBz up to about probably 55,000 uh, feet or so. And, and reflectivity is greater than uh, 50 dBz, well above the melting level. We're seeing such intense convection, almost similar to what you'd see in a supercell. Uh, and usually when we see strong convection like this, these convected bursts, it's typically in the uh, somewhat early stages of storm development. Uh, and it's led to a lot of ideas that these convective bursts play a role in intensification. This case is interesting because this convective burst occurs slightly after the peak intensity of the storm. And it's still not clear to us why such severe convection was occurring uh, at this life cycle stage of the storm. Uh, here's an, another example from the hamster microwave uh, sounder on the ER2 during Emily. One of the advantages of the sounder is that in the clear air, it can give you temperature profiles. Uh, this is showing temperature perturbations in the eye of Emily. Uh, so this is only about a seven kilometer distance here. But you're able to get the vertical structure of temperature. Now, th this warming here is a bit of an oddity. And it's not clear whether that's just due to the reference profile they decided to use to come up with the anomaly. Or if it, in some way, it's tied to that very strong, deep convection that's getting up to the tropopause and maybe causing particularly strong subsidence aloft. Uh, typically, this is where you'll see the, the most warming. Uh, in addition, because of the wide range of frequencies that are on Hamster, um, each frequency uh, samples different levels uh, in the troposphere. And it's able to actually do uh, vertical profiles of precipitation. Uh, so it's almost like a little virtual radar, not with the same sort of accuracy as a radar, uh, but it still gives you a, a lot of information about vertical structure. And then the last example is from the NAMA campaign for the pre-Helene system. This is a MODIS image showing a wide swath of dust here to the north. Uh, this is precipitation in pre-Helene. Uh, and these images come out of a recent BAMS article by Zipser et al. that was describing the field campaign. Uh, and the lower plot shows data uh, along the flight lake from A to B and then in towards C. Uh, and this is the LAYS data, the LIDAR, which shows dust down at low levels uh, encroaching upon the storm, the cirrus aloft. And then here's data from the APR2 radar on the DC-8. And one of the things that they suggested in this paper was that this dust was being brought around to the western side of the storm and then uh, entrained into the circulation. And in their figure, they even show this direct transport of the dust into the convection. And an argument has been made in, in Jenkins and Pratt and Jenkins et al. Uh, that this dust invigorated the convection in this case, despite the fact that they, they had no idea what would have happened without the dust. So they really couldn't make that sort of conclusion. Uh, and there's also a big question mark, not only in, in the sense that the dust starts diminishing as you get close to the storm, but the storm relative winds were such that it was very difficult to envision this dust getting into the storm. And in fact, subsequent mo modus in, uh, imagery had most of that dust blowing by to the west. So a big question is, what role did the Saharan air layer play in this event, at least in early stages? And this is where the modeling can really come into play in terms of having a model that can handle dust emission and transport, as well as the interaction with microphysics and radiation. Now, the next experiment is the genesis and rapid intensification processes experiment, which will be done in mid-August through September of this year. It's going to involve the NASA DC-8, and for the first time, the NASA Global Hawk and will, again, involve coordination with NOAA and NSF. Uh, the advantage of the Global Hawk, uh, it has a 30-hour flight duration. Uh, uh, so you can get out over a storm and be out over a storm for far longer than we're currently capable of doing. Uh, the altitude, uh, it gets up to 55,000 feet very quickly. Uh, it's going to be flying out of California because that's where our current ground station is. So by the time it leaves California airspace, it'll already be at 55,000 feet. By the time it gets to, uh, and then it takes it over about 20 hours as it burns off fuel, it gradually gets up to 65,000 feet by about 20 hours into the flight. Uh, this is the payload, uh, a conically scanning Doppler radar, the Hamster uh, microwave sounder, drops on. It'll be capable of dropping up to 100 drops in a single flight. And then there'll be a lightning uh, image uh, package as well. Uh, now, the one thing I'm going to say about this is the pilots are going to be extremely cautious in putting this aircraft over a storm because they've never done it before. So they're basically going to work their way into a storm. And as long as they don't encounter strong turbulence, uh, they will continue inward. If they do encounter turbulence, they'll come back out and either try again or fly in the environment. This shows you the range. Uh, we'll fly from California to the Gulf. And then we can have 20 hours or slightly more in the Gulf. 
We can go all the way out to the central Atlantic and be out there for up to 10 hours on station, so more than what we're able to do uh, with current aircraft uh, flying uh, e even in regions close to Florida. If for some reason the, the season's in, relatively inactive in the Atlantic, we can also go down into the East Pack and spend 15 to 20 hours over storms down in that region. Uh, I mentioned that we'll be using the DC-8, but I'm not going to go into too much detail there since I'm running out of time. Um, here are the instruments. The one really new instrument this year is Dawn. It's, it's a wind LIDAR similar to what they'll be flying on the P3. So we'll be collecting between us and the P3 and the PREDIC folks. This is going to be an unprecedented data set. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be some great data for you to work with uh, for modeling. And my last slide, I'm going to show um, a, a quick summary. Of, this is a proposal, a proposed mission to NASA for their venture class announcement of opportunity, uh, where we want to go one step further. Uh, we propose to uh, fly two Global Hawks, one equipped for the environment and one equipped for overstorm activities. Uh, by this point, we'll have a mobile ground station that can be based in Wallops, Virginia, so that we'll be able to fly out of the East Coast. And so we'll be able to fly all the way to the coast of Africa and have 10 hours on station. Uh, just unprecedented coverage. Um, you know, similar instruments to what's available in GRIP, uh, and we hope to hear by April or May uh, in terms of whether this gets funded. And if we hear in time, maybe we'll be able to make an announcement at the Tropical Conference. So I'll stop there and take any questions.